In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the third time in these first three weekdays of Holy Week that our Gospel reading is at part in, li- in part at least about Judas, one of the twelve, the betrayer of Jesus. On Monday we heard about his resentful response to Mary of Bethany's loving and generous act in anointing our Lord with the pound of pure nard. The reason for his doing this, we were told, is that Judas is greedy and that he is a thief. He wants to sell the ointment and pocket the proceeds for himself. Theft is sin, of course it is, but we might think that simple greed is all too common, too human a phenomenon to explain something as profoundly shocking as the betrayal of the Son of God. Yesterday evening, In the continuation of the story according to St. John, we were given another reason to explain Judas's actions. We were told that Satan entered into him and that having become possessed by Satan, Judas left the supper which Jesus was eating with his disciples. And in that haunting verse, John tells us that as Judas went out, it was night. So here, the possession by Satan, accompanied by the fall of darkness, is the suggestion of a kind of supernatural explanation for Judas's behavior. We might say then that there is in the pages of the New Testament a debate about what motivates Judas, a debate which continues on a much broader canvas to this very day. Is evil the result of our twisted human desires theft or whatever else that might be, or is it of the power of influence of something outside of ourselves, the demonic, Satan, whatever other term you might want to use? Well, I won't attempt to solve that dilemma this evening. The best answer I'd have thought is both of the above. But I would suggest that what we learn about Judas this evening is even more serious and alarming than being told either that he was greedy and a thief or that Satan had entered into him and that he had become possessed by evil because that latter, I suppose, might not have been his fault at all. Because what St. Matthew tells us tonight is that Judas, having gone to the chief priests and been paid 30 pieces of silver and having resolved to betray our Lord at the earliest possible opportunity, then joins in with the astonishment, horror, and denial which all the disciples share when the Lord says that one of them is going to betray him. Not I, Rabbi, surely, Judas says, although he knows he's already done it. And Jesus' words in reply signal that Judas has condemned himself out of his own mouth. So what was Judas thinking? Was it simply barefaced denial, a brazen attempt to conceal his guilt? Or was it more complicated than that? Was there a sense in which Judas could not really believe or accept what it was that he had done? That this was deceit, yes, but what kind of deceit? An exercise in self-deceit as much as an attempt to deceive others. If we're honest, we know that we are all capable of deceiving ourselves and of allowing one or more parts or aspects of our lives to get seriously out of kilter with the rest. And deceiving the self can slide easily into trying to deceive God. I well remember the priest who was my first spiritual director having a large sign in the downstairs loo with a text from the 16th chapter of Genesis, Thou, God, seest me. That's one very good corrective to the false belief that one can deceive the Almighty. 
another and a perhaps more sensible suggestion, and especially appropriate, of course, at this time of year, is to make your confession to a priest. This ministry is readily available and on offer in this church, and it is a sublime means of grace and of experiencing the divine mercy. And short of self-deceit, or of the foolish enterprise of trying to deceive God, is that sense of struggle with ourselves, of all too often somehow working against ourselves, of knowing what we should be doing, and in fact doing the opposite. The Apostle St. Paul famously understands this all too human tendency very well when he writes to the Christians in Rome, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. The religious poetry of John Donne, our companion this week, is full of this sense of the conflicted or divided self, of the capacity of ourselves to work against ourselves. In part one of A Litany, that stanza subtitled The Father, Donne writes of how he and we are all created for heaven, but we become clay because of our tendency toward melancholy and despair. And not only clay, but red clay or red earth, an implied pun on the Hebrew word Adam, which means red. But Dunn says that the clay is red, red with blood as it were, because of his and therefore our tendency towards what he calls self-murder. Not literally suicide, but just that ability to act, to act against what is truly in our own best interests, spiritually as it were, to do ourselves in. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in return for his soul? Dunn seems to understand precisely what our Lord is getting at in this teaching. There is no point going off after everything else if in the process we succeed in killing off the only truly valuable self or soul which we possess. And that is what exists in complete harmony with God's purposes for us and not our own. Well, Dunn understands not just the diagnosis, but also knows precisely where the medicine is to be found. This warring self, which leads him and us inevitably into sin, is a cause of the Lord's death. O oh, be thou nailed unto my heart and crucified again, he writes. But the death, the death of Christ on the cross, is also the means of healing. But let it, that is to say, the sinful heart, but let it be applying so thy pain, drowned in thy blood and in thy passion slain. The remedy is Christ's passion. The medicine is his blood. Blood which here surely is intended to make us think of baptism, the waters of regeneration in which the new Christian is drowned before rising up again out of those waters, cleansed and ready for eternal life. Well, we've no, no way of knowing, in the end, precisely why Judas chose or was chosen to betray Jesus. And we've no easy answer in this Holy Week or at any other time as to why each of us will give in less or more frequently to this sinuous and slippery tendency, both for self-deceit and for self-justification. But what we can and we must do is give thanks in Holy Week and always, for the one who, by his death and resurrection, can alone free us from the nets we throw around ourselves, the nets in which we get more and more tangled up until, like poor animals trying to free ourselves from a snare, we just become hopelessly and fatally trapped. And this is so because for Jesus, in his suffering and in his death, there is no self-deceit and there is no self-justification. There is nothing but that patient, transparent openness to his Father's will, whatever the cost. 
So Jesus does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He frees us, not only from the grip of Satan, but from the stranglehold which is our own will to self-murder. He takes the red clay of our fallen humanity and makes us fit for heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.